So my dear friends, Halloween is so very, very nearly upon us, and I promised you four anthology videos in the lead up to this special day of ours, and I've only delivered two so far, so I think I need to get my ass into gear, don't I? Well, yes. With that in mind, I have another one for you tonight. Four phenomenal, creepy, terrifying tales of fantasy, mystery, and terror. <laughs> Well, my dear friends, it's Friday, we've made it to the weekend, so you definitely deserve once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. I know where the pennies came from originally. I took a trip to visit my sister in the Netherlands, and when I came back and exchanged a bunch of leftover euros back into dollars, I had about 40 or 50 dollars in my pocket. I live in a smaller urban environment, which is not really a vibrant city, but not a small town either. There's a fountain in a park on the way to my job and my home, and there's a youth homeless shelter that chaperones many field trips for the children to play in the park with frisbee discs and other team sports. The younger kids like to make wishes by tossing coins into the fountains, and one day I got into a conversation with one of the chaperones that making wishes was in fact so popular that the children had been accosted for taking money out of the fountain and tossing the coins back in. Well, I probably could have put down cash or check and made a small donation with the leftover money from my trip, but in an uncharacteristically creative and charitable move, I went to a bank and exchanged thirty dollars into a backpack full of pennies in a hundred coin rams. I know, this whole idea sounds stupid, but the truth was I was trying to ingratiate myself with one of the female chaperones who, it just so happens, had been the one to tell me about the kids making wishes in this world. My plan was to present what was basically an infinite supply of wishes to the children so they would never be accosted by park officials for taking money out of the fountain. In my mind, it seemed like this plan was better than just handing money over to the homeless shelter, especially when it could be in full view of the uh, female chaperone I planned to ask out. All I had to do was wait for the next field trip put on by the homeless shelter at the end of that month. <sighs> Things went off the rails when I came home one day and found the pennies missing. That wasn't the first terribly wrong thing I found when I returned to my apartment after my college classes. Oh. My door was bolted shut from the inside. I have one of those swing bar locks that lets you open the door a little after you unlock the key base locks. You know, up until that point, never been completely caught so off guard. I mindlessly unlocked my door and pushed the door inward, planning on pushing it open the full way and walking in the same way I did every day after class. But the door stopped a few inches in, and I partially walked into the door itself bumping my head against the painted wood and stepping back in shock. The slide bar lock was visibly in use, and as soon as the thought that someone was in my apartment without my knowledge or permission entered my head, I went straight to my landlord's office and we called the police. We stood outside my partially open door, with the bolt still keeping the door sealed, but still partially open. We could see that my messy apartment did not have anybody standing in my living room, but the closet and bathroom doors were closed, so it was impossible to be sure if someone was in those areas or not. We called inside, including the landlord and the police, but we heard nothing. No response, no sound of movement, absolutely nothing. That is, until we heard what sounded like a bunch of coins falling onto the floor. Slow footsteps on top of piles of coins made all of our eyes go wide. What the f... I said under my breath, my mind immediately going to the pennies I had in an opened Amazon box I'd saved after ordering a few things online. That had been in my closet in the corner, on the floor. It was impossible that they could have fallen unless someone had gotten them from the closet and had dropped them. It was so close that we all realised the same thing at the same time. That was right on the other side of the door. One of the two police officers stated grimly. He turned towards myself and my landlord. I'm going to need both of you to step back. My landlord and I complied with the police officer, 
and watched as they drew their weapons. You are trespassing on private property, stated the senior police officer in a loud voice. Open the door and vacate the premises, or we will forcibly remove you. Not even the sound of coins dropping this time. A few people were peeking out of their own doors into the hallway my apartment was located on to see what was happening. But only silence came from my apartment. The lights were all off, and the blind was over my window in the far corner of the room. This is your final warning. When he received no reply, he looked at my landlord. Sir, I'm going to need your permission to break down the lock on this door. Who's going to pay for it? My landlord asked quietly, still spooked by the sound of coins and footsteps, but not completely forgetting how much of a greedy cheapskate he was. Well, the responsible party, the police officer added vaguely. He looked at me. Is there any other way into or out of this apartment room? What? I stammered, shaking myself. No, of course not. Fess up now, the police officer with fewer stripes urged. Holes into adjoining apartments, hidden ladders into the floor above or beneath us. It's all going to come out in the wash anyway. We need to know what we're getting into. Well, I was dumbfounded. The scrutiny these officers were placing on me was surprising and made me incredibly uncomfortable. But what they were saying sounded insane at the time. My landlord was staring at me with a dreadful gravity, like his eyes were telling me to admit something I was hiding, when in fact I was hiding nothing. There's no secret passages, I said, barely hiding the bitterness in my tone. There's just the door and the window. The sound of breaking glass made all of us look back at the cracked door. The senior police officer delivered a powerful kick that didn't quite knock the door's lock off, but cracked the wood into which the lock screws were placed. The second kick finally opened the door of my apartment, and both of the police officers rushed in, clearing the living room, followed by my closets and bathroom. In two minutes, they were done. Clear, said the senior police officer, sounding frustrated and disappointed. There's no one here. A moment passed when the other police officer started swearing. Holy shit, what's up with this window? I watched him roll up the blind and discover that the windows were broken with large holes in the top and bottom halves of the frame. It was like something had punched clean through the glass. That explained the sound we'd heard that had prompted the police officer's entry. But now we had the window in plain view through the crack in the locked door. A missing glass from the holes was found outside my apartment in the area below. It seemed impossible that something had punched through the window on the interior side when the blinds had not been affected in any way. Could you both come in here? My landlord and I silently entered in and we saw something that chilled me to the bone. The paper wraps in which I'd received the pennies from the bank were all sitting in a pile in the middle of my otherwise normally messy floor. Only two or three dollars worth of pennies were found splayed out onto the floor, again explaining the sound of the coins dropping, but not how they'd gotten out of my closet's floor, or what had caused those footsteps we'd all heard. What was even more disturbing was my landlord's reaction. He was terrified rather than dumbfounded, as I was, and he slowly reached down, retrieved one of the empty wraps, and his jaw dropped. He let the wrapper fall from his fingers onto the floor before he turned to me. What the fuck were you doing with so many pennies? He asked me in a deranged voice. He grabbed my shirt by the collar and pulled me close. What the fuck would anyone need that many pennies? What the hell is wrong with you? I was trying to tell my landlord to let go of me. The police officers broke us up and took our official statements separately. I told them about my plan to give the pennies to the homeless shelter. I hadn't told anyone about my bit of philanthropy, and well, I had no idea why my landlord had been so upset with me. They told me to keep in touch in case I thought anyone was stalking me. Nothing was stolen, except for the grand majority of the pennies the bank had given me, the exception being the splayed-out ones we had heard drop. 
That pile of pennies was close to the centre of the room too, so it was impossible to determine where exactly they'd fallen from, unless they were thrown, but that seemed equally unlikely. The police officers left, and the next time I saw my landlord, I tried to ask him why he'd acted the way he had. Listen to me very carefully, he said, seated across from me in his office. He insisted I close the door behind me when I came in. I'm, oh, I'm sorry for acting the way I did. I will personally cover the costs for both the damaged door, the window, and the money that was stolen. I tried to ask him why he'd become so angry when I'd examined the wrapper. Instead, he made me explain why I had so many pennies in the first place. I told him everything, even my ulterior motive to get close to the female chaperone at the homeless shelter. I tried to probe him further about the information he was obviously keeping from me and the authorities. No, don't ask me that. You don't want to know. I'm doing you a favor and you're going to return the favor. You are never going to talk about this to anyone. Not me, not the other residents. No one. I suggest not even your family. If I catch you telling other people, especially new residents, you'll be evicted with as little notice as the law provides. And you're going to swear to me, on your grandmother's grave, you will never have that many pennies in your apartment ever again. It's like you dumped a sack of sugar onto an ant colony. I was speechless. I stared at my landlord for a long time, hoping he'd say something else. Is this place haunted? I asked quietly. Nope. He gave me a patronizing grin and raised his eyebrows. I recognized his tone to be one where, well... I somehow knew it was a question he'd answered many times before, and his lack of taking offense to it made me really unsure if he was telling the truth or just lying very convincingly. My landlord told me to go, and I left. I mindlessly wandered towards my apartment and was relieved that the repairman had already fixed my door, and I hoped to see the same result with my window. I didn't mourn the loss of the money and almost forgot about the whole thing until I started finding the coins all around my home. A few times I woke up with some pennies scattered on top of my blankets. Sometimes I found them in my shoes, but I only really started to panic when they showed up on my keyboard. Oh, and on the toilet seat. The first time I screamed in this mess was when I was reading a post and got out of my seat. A penny fell off my shoulder and fell onto the floor when I moved to get up. Whatever had taken the coins originally, the place went on my person without me even noticing. One day, one of the neighbors knocked on my door and asked to speak to me. Her name was Mrs. Shea. She was about 20 years older than me and had two children in middle school. Other than saying hi in the hallway, we'd never interacted before this point. She insisted we speak outside of the apartment building, and she finally started talking in the parking lot and out of view of the manager's office window. Are you finding pennies around your apartment? Her tone grew serious. In places they definitely shouldn't be. I was taken aback. I... Yes, yeah, the landlord. Swore you to secrecy. Same here. Look, it doesn't matter. Listen... They want more pennies from you. I involuntarily scoffed at her. What? What are you talking about? Who is they? How do you even know this was happening to me? I heard the police go into your room. I heard the coins drop. I knew what they were taking. Who? The police? No. I was starting to get annoyed. Well, then who? A look of extreme discomfort came across her face. I have no idea. Mrs. Shea normally always had a composed look about her, but now she looked distressed. Her eyes were wide with uncertainty. My, my two boys had a coin jar and they collected all the loose change they found at school and in our truck. Most of it was pennies. I had no idea where this was going, but I didn't like it anyway. One day, all the pennies vanished. 
She smiled sadly. And then we started finding them everywhere. I thought my sons were playing a joke on me, but it happened even when they spent time with their father after that. I confronted them, but they looked just as scared as I felt. They told me they were tiny people collecting the coins and wanted more pennies from us. I yelled at them, but then I started to find the pennies in my clothes when I woke up in the morning. She paused like she was waiting for a reaction, and she got annoyed when I said nothing. In my clothes? The ones I was sleeping in? There was a bit of frenzy in our eyes. I'm not with anyone presently. No one was around to do that. Jeez, I muttered. Pretty soon things got malicious, she continued. Todd woke up, choking on a penny. He's 16. He hasn't cried in years. Not before this. He usually blames his brother for stuff like this, but he was convinced the tiny people in the walls did this to him. She wiped a few tears away from her face and she let out a rough breath. I wordlessly listened, frozen where I was standing. Finally, I started going to the bank and cashing four dollars worth of pennies every month. I leave a hundred in a roll on the table, Monday morning after my kids go to school, and before I leave for work. It's always gone when I come back, but they leave the bank round. I had no idea how to react. Mrs. Shea hardly knew me and had never seemed crazy before, so I was actually believing her. Whatever these... I found I had to clear my throat after listening as intently as I did. What the hell do they want with the pennies? Why would they leave pennies after taking them? I don't know, Mrs. Shea handed desperately. I just know that it left me and my family alone when I started doing that. They want more pennies from you, and they're not going to stop. Oh, there's one more thing. God, I'm such an idiot. I didn't start leaving the pennies after Todd almost choked to death on one of them. One night I was sleeping under the blanket, and I felt... I felt like something was walking on top of the blanket. I was awake. I wasn't dreaming. I was too afraid to move. It felt like dozens of tiny cats walking on top of me, but I knew somehow that they weren't cats. They didn't feel like cats. They didn't move or sound like them either. They didn't talk or make any sounds, but I thought I heard them walking on the ceiling too. I heard them go away. I don't know where, but I think they get into the wall somehow. I didn't sleep, and when my kids came in asking me to break breakfast, they started freaking out that there were dozens of pennies on top of the blanket I was sleeping under. I don't know if they knew I was under the blanket, but I know that they were there. I don't know what they were going to do to me, but well, I went straight to the bank and, well, I just treat it like another tax now. Long story short, I moved the hell out of that apartment complex. My landlord didn't ask me too many questions, and didn't tell me much either. He wished me good luck and, well, that was the last I saw of him. I never reached out to Mrs. Shea again and she never approached me again either. I swallowed my pride and asked out that female chaperone, and things have actually progressed a surprising amount. Turns out I didn't need to fake being a saint of charity, just needed the guts to sound confident and give it an honest shot. I'm leaving out her name because she doesn't play a big part in this story, but we started living together at her house. I'm scraping together what money I have to get a ring and propose next spring, and needless to say I'm keeping my savings in cash. Dimes and quarters are the smallest coins I pick up on the side of the road. Each time I see a penny somewhere, at work or in town, I always tell myself that it was a normal human being that left it there. It's not some kind of ominous demand that I don't entirely understand the logic behind. I make it a point to throw any pennies I find into that wishing well in the park every chance I get. You can probably guess. But, well, my wish is that I never have to learn what those things crawling around that apartment complex are, and why they're obsessed with stealing pennies from people's homes. I still find pennies scattered around my girlfriend's house like any normal person, but I can't help but look at them with just a bit of leftover dread. Sadly, 
You can never be sure where exactly those damn things go. Look, Amanda, I said. The police are stopping the search. They said they haven't found a trace, and it's been five days now. Amanda looked at me with such malice and hatred that I felt a chill running down my spine. So, you just want to stop the search now? I mean, it's only our daughter. She's out there, frightened, and you just want to stop the search? I felt as if I'd been punched in the gut. Tears were welling up, but I managed to reply. Don't even say that. Of course I want them to continue the search, but I'm not in charge of the police. Please, honey, don't see me as the enemy. I love you. I love Charlene. Don't speak her name, she yelled. You just see the search as an inconvenience to you. Just leave me be. I did as she asked, going out of the bedroom and into the living room of our cabin. I sat down on the couch, hands on face, and cried over the loss of our daughter. And now, my estranged wife. That night I decided to sleep on the couch. I heard Amanda sobbing throughout the night. Even though I wanted to comfort her, I felt she needed space. The next morning I awoke, tired and stiff from a bad spell of sleep. I decided to make some breakfast, eggs and bacon, and brought it up to her. Here, darling, I made breakfast, I said. She looked at me with puffy red eyes. Is that all you can think of, when our daughter is somewhere out there, scared out of her life? I sighed. Look, it won't do her any good if we stop our lives, stop taking care of ourselves. You need to eat. She looked away, tears welling up. The day continued like that, me trying to get any contact to Amanda and her turning down my attempts. It made me sadder each time, as I really wanted to connect with her again, needed to connect with her. After all, she was my wife, and I wanted to help her in her situation as well as help myself. I couldn't go through all of this alone. And I was sure she couldn't either. I had to make some sort of breakthrough. And the day went on like that. Me trying to do anything to make a connection with Amanda and her, either ignoring me completely or getting aggressive towards me. Each time I failed, it felt we were gliding farther and farther from each other. Each time I felt as if my heart was being stomped on. I felt worse and worse. As the day faded into evening, I decided to make dinner for us. I helped Amanda down to the dining room and sat her in her chair. I sat down in my seat and started eating. A bit into the meal, I glanced over at her, checking how she was doing. She was poking her fork at the meal listlessly, her stare shifting from the meal to the window, then back to the meal and letting out a long, sad sigh. Pain me to see her like this. Not her normal, cheerful self, but then again, I was a total mess inside. But I felt I had to stay strong, for the both of us. Wouldn't do any good if we both just crumbled down and stopped functioning out here, in the middle of the woods. I was also hungry, on top of all the sadness. Angry that the cops and park rangers decided that it would be too dangerous to continue the search. There had been a massive rain about a week ago. There had been some flooding, and the rangers had said that conditions were bad. And therefore, the search would be called off for now. I shouted at them, pleaded with them, but to no avail. The ranger said that he understood me, but he couldn't risk the lives of the search party made me angry that they could just wave off the life of a four-year-old like that. Such an inconvenience to search for her. And eventually I broke down in tears. Amanda looked at me and started crying too. The next day we were just sat in the dining room, looking at each other, then looking out the window, all in silence. We both knew how each other felt. We also knew we couldn't just go out and search on our own. For starters, we didn't really know the woods. We could easily get lost in there if we went in too far. Secondly, we weren't equipped for a long stretch in the woods, and our clothing wasn't really helpful against the elements. 
We probably wouldn't survive long if we got lost. No need for that, no matter the circumstances. I tried several times to talk to her. Sometimes she acknowledges me. Other times she just stared out the window, or stared right at me, or right past me. She never really answered. Then again, it was hard to make small talk when this had happened, and I didn't know what to talk to her about. The incident was weighing heavily upon both of us, and again, the day seemed to fade away like a dream you can't really remember. I was a bit surprised when I realised it had turned dark outside. I stood up and was going to prepare dinner. And then I thought I heard Charlene's voice coming from the woods. Mommy! Daddy! I'm scared! Followed by a short, muffled scream. That's the best I can describe it as. Now I was starting to hear things. I looked at Amanda and saw that her eyes were wide open as well as her mouth. Had she heard it too? We looked at each other in stunned silence, and then we heard it again. Mommy, Daddy, I'm scared, followed by that muffled scream. But there was something wrong. I just couldn't put my finger on it. But there was something at the back of my mind warning me against this. Amanda shouted, Charlene, and leapt up. She didn't even put on shoes. She just ran outside. I tried to call her, to stop her, but she was gone in an instant. I ran after her, hoping she would come to her senses. Amanda! I yelled. I saw where she'd run into the woods, darting past trees and stumps. I ran after her as fast as I could. She kept darting out of my sight, but I yelled at her. Amanda, please, stop! As I ran into a small clearing, I could see Amanda there, looking in each direction. Honey, please, I said. We don't know where she is. It won't help her if we get lost in here. She looked at me with such fury that I thought for a second she hated me. Well, go back to the cabin. Go back and just leave our daughter out here in the woods. You don't care about her. You don't even care about me. The force of those words, the angry tone, and the hatred in her eyes. The words and our current situation were too much for me. I could feel the tears well up in my eyes. I covered my face with my hands and cried a bit. Don't even suggest that, honey. You two are my world, I said. As I removed my hands from my face, I realized Amanda was gone. Amanda! I screamed. Now I was getting a bit scared. Where had she gone? Amanda! I screamed again, more urgently. I heard some rustling of leaves to my right. I didn't think. I just sprinted there, calling out to Amanda every few seconds. It was hard to navigate the woods in the dark. I called out to Amanda, then tried to listen to any sounds, either from Amanda or Charlene. After a few minutes, I heard something behind me. Mommy, Daddy, I'm scared. But it wasn't Charlene's voice. It sounded like several voices at once. A cold chill ran down my spine. What on earth could that be? Then to my left, I heard Amanda's voice. Oh, honey, I've missed you so much. Come to Mommy followed by a blood-curdling scream. Amanda! I yelled as I ran towards the sound. Branches flew by as I hurried towards where I'd heard Amanda screaming. What's going on in these woods? I thought as I ran. Suddenly, I tripped over something. I fell down hard, knocking my forehead. I saw stars as I lay on the ground, wondering what had happened. Then... As my vision started to clear, I realized I'd tripped over a person. A person wearing what seemed to be Amanda's clothing, although it was ripped in places, and there was blood. Oh, God, there was so much blood. 
I screamed as I realized what I was seeing. It was Amanda. Or what was left of her. Her torso had been cut open from the neck down to her hip. Most of her innards were gone. And her face, oh God, her beautiful face. The eyes were gone. The mouth was open in a terrified scream. I hugged her, crying, screaming her name. The pain was unbearable. And then I heard it. Rustling of leaves behind me. And Amanda's voice saying, Oh, honey. I've missed you so much. Come to mommy. My great-grandfather was an odd man. Extremely so. He never liked being around people who weren't family. I have fond memories of him, but, well, I'll always remember the one rule at his home. Stay out of the basement. It happened when I was 14. I was becoming rebellious, and I was tired of being told what to do. And, most importantly, I wanted to know what was in the basement. So, one night, while spending the night there, I decided to investigate while he slept. As I tiptoed down the stairs, I cringed as there was an audible creak when I hit the last step. I paused trying to listen for the telltale sound of my great-grandfather waking up. I exhaled in relief, when I was only met with a dead silence. I crept toward the kitchen, my flashlight lit in preparation. On the kitchen bar sat today's newspaper from the local gazette. I slowly opened the basement door, eyeing the darkness. As I reached the bottom, I looked around. Around me were desks piled with papers. On one desk sat five tapes and a lone tape player. I looked at one of the papers and blinked upon spotting the US military logo on it, titled Project Untold. The date on the paper read August 5th, 1942. The rest of the paper, and all the other ones, were in some sort of code made up of dashes and pluses. So, I set my eyes on the tapes, which seemed to be in order, lined up. The first one's label read, Tape 1 of 5. Curiosity getting the best of me, I examined the tapes. They seemed to be standard Max L tapes. So, with all that done, I inserted the tape and pressed play. My great-grandfather's voice emerged. It's my greatest regret in life. What we did was an unholy act against humanity itself, which we all deserve to burn in hell for. The word untold is German for living dead. We... We wanted to create soldiers who would rise after being fatally shot and simply go back to killing the Nazis. Well, until their heads had been blasted off. Or until they'd been blown to smithereens, of course. And who was I in all this? I was a man who shot all the test subjects dead before the scientists began testing. Shooting down innocents. The homeless people we gather off the streets. Criminals who had no chance of parole. I had to shoot them all dead. I... <sighs> I was so sure I'd get used to hearing them scream in agony. I was wrong. To this day, I can still hear their screams when I try to sleep at night. I hear their agony. I hear their begging. So, what happened to them after I shot them dead? I never knew. Until one day, when they briefed me on what this was all about, and, and that they finally succeeded and they wanted me to shoot it to see if it was killable so they told me to go to the testing chamber 
All the while I had a bad feeling about it all. Did it remember? Could it even feel? Did it remember me taking its life? I came to a locked, military-grade door. The scientist nearby pulled some levers, opening the door. Inside sat a man, or what was once a man, struggling with his bindings, grunting and growling like an animal. Oh, I was barely able to recognize it as a living being. It looked more like a corpse. But what struck me first, after getting closer to him, were the wires, leading to two metal spikes planted directly into his head. The wires led to an electric switch built into the wall. A voice suddenly spoke from the nearby speaker. I recognized the voice as the director of this entire project, Joseph Bellows. Shoot the subject. I blinked, having shortly forgot my orders while looking at the thing. Shoot the subject, he growled seeming to grow even more impatient. With that, I pulled out my weapon, and I shot him with my assault rifle. But this time, he didn't even scream. He... He screeched like some sort of banshee. But eventually, the thing went limp and silent. I could almost feel the relief of the scientists. All right. Your work here is... Suddenly, the thing began to screech once more and broke its bindings. I gasped, running through the door, shutting it as the scientists pulled the levers, locking the door with a loud clunk. And with all that said, the tape ended with a click that seemed to echo through the silent room. I, well, I didn't know what to think. What the hell did they do to make that thing? This couldn't be real. This had to be a hoax of some sort. Seeing the closet door ajar, I opened the door and switched on the light, expecting to find my great-grandfather laughing. This all being a hoax he's planned for years. Nothing could, or would, ever prepare me for what I saw in that closet. My great-grandfather, hanging from a noose. Never been in love. That burning emotion of passion. One that surges through your soul. Able to transcend all of time itself. That feeling you'll think can last forever. Only to be shut down by the harsh fist of reality. The shattering dread that fills you for months. Years after it ends. Be it due to drama, distance or death. What if you can make a single moment of bliss last forever? to be united with your soulmate for the rest of eternity. Would you take that chance? Or would you let it slip through your fingers like I did? I was given the chance of forever, but now I'm doomed to live out my days, and eventually die and be washed away by the marching passage of time, while she is one with the bleeding tree, flesh stripped from her bones as she's nurturing the ever-growing forest, suffering until the end of days. It was our seven-year anniversary, and I promised Jen the perfect date. As we were both avid hikers, I figured a getaway picnic in a secluded spot, miles away from any other sentient being, would be ideal. Together we travelled on every trail, camped in every forest, and climbed each mountain within a hundred-mile radius, which of course made it difficult to find a new romantic spot anywhere nearby. But after asking around on different forums and getting advice from some of our travelling buddies, I finally learned about a place only a three-hour drive away from our city. A decently desolated forest named Morsewoods, which had very few trails. A hidden wonder of nature, which was exactly what we needed. One afternoon, a couple of days before our anniversary, I drove out myself to scout the area. I'd taken the day off work without telling Jen, to set off on my secret mission. I walked through the forest, marking trees with orange cloth as I made my way, hoping I'd randomly stumble upon a body of water, maybe a clearing to set up a basket and enjoy the sun. The forest ran wild with life, 
birds emerging from each tree as I walked past, curious to the new creature that had invaded their home, walking around on two legs with no wings. Through the trees, I could see a clearing in the forest, separated by a thick wall of thorny bushes. No sign of anyone ever wandering through, so I lay down on my knees and crawled my way through, cutting myself on the thorns in the process. But it was worth it. On the other side I found a clear, open space only decorated by a lake and a single tree on the side, standing tall with branches spreading out so thick it provided a perfect parasol of cover against the midday sun. Oh, it was perfect. After a quick survey of the area, I decided to dig a small hole under the tree, digging down a casket containing a bottle of wine alongside any non-perishable food. The picnic would be a surprise, and at its end I would bring out the true anniversary gift, an engagement ring. Nothing too impressive, just a silver band with a half a carat diamond. Still, something I'd been saving up towards for the better part of a year. Being in our late twenties and all, young but determined, ready for commitment. The next two days passed at a snail's pace, waiting for the day to arrive. We'd both agreed to <laughs> call in sick, waking up at the break of dawn. We had a system where we each had our turn at arranging our anniversary date, and this year it was my chance to impress. Last date, she'd taken me for a weekend trip up a mountain, and now I am to make it a day to remember for the rest of our lives. We drove the almost 200 miles away from our city towards Morsewoods, before quickly making our way through the dense forest. It was the peak time for birds' mating calls, joyfully greeting us as we wandered through, enjoying the sun rising above the tree line. Deers had just started waking up, jumping curiously through the trees to inspect their new guests. Admittedly, I got a tad lost on the way, with a few of the cloth pieces having fallen off the trees. I was in the lead, trying to guide, and didn't want to admit my inadequacy. Walking a few yards ahead, I stumbled upon a dead deer in our path. It was bizarre, half buried in the ground, half the flesh torn from its body. No smell, so it couldn't have been there for very long, yet it just seemed so rotten. Before Jan could see it, I admitted that we'd gone off the path, and as soon as she realised we were off track, we just retraced our steps and quickly found our way again. Somewhere around ten, we found the thick wall of bushes and crawled through. I created a decent-sized hole during my previous visit, ensuring that Jen wouldn't get hurt on the thorns. A nasty cut would have been a huge turn-off for any date. And there it was, the perfect spot. Even more delightfully idyllic in the glimmering morning light, reflecting on the dewdrops covering the leaves. So... What do you think? I asked. Oh, wow. It's unbelievable. How did you find this place? A <laughs> trade secret. I'd tell you, but then I'd have to kill you, I joked. Oh, I'm sure I can find a way to extract that information later, she said as she winked at me. We'd brought a picnic basket with bread, spreads, and freshly made salad. Nothing too fancy, but Jen still didn't know about the hidden stash I'd put away under the tree. Hey, what's this? Jen said as she spotted a heart-shaped red balloon stuck under one of the tree branches. Beneath it hung a string, with an envelope attached to it. Jen jumped up and pulled it down, carefully detaching the envelope and tying the balloon around her wrist to stop it from floating away. Oh, that's so sweet. You didn't have to, she said as she opened the envelope, pulling out a handwritten letter. Jen... I didn't, I tried to explain, but she'd already started reading. She quickly realized I had nothing to do with the letter, and when her face turned from joy to disappointment, but, well, she shook away her frown and returned to her gleeful self. I guess somebody found this place before you, she giggled, as she began reading the letter out loud. Dear Sandra, you wouldn't believe a place like this could exist. Undiscovered and hidden from the rest of civilization. Oh, it's so beautiful. A secret garden of Eden. And the best part is, I found it on accident. I bought you this balloon for your birthday. 
I wanted to tell you in person that I love you, but I guess I'm a coward. I realise we haven't told each other that yet, but I figured it would fit better here, by the crystal clear lake and the wonderful wildlife, especially the ducks. But, well, I can't leave. There'll be excellent food for the bleeding tree. I know how much you like ducks, but when I found this place, the tree was dying, and it wasn't strong enough to consume me, but if I feed it the birds, the rabbits, or whatever other wildlife inhabits this area, I can finally merge with it and become one with the forest. I wish I could have taken you here, but I've already planted the seed within me, and if I leave, the seed will die. I'll attach this letter to the balloon and hope it finds you. Maybe you can come here and join me. The bleeding tree needs our flesh to live. Love, Jack. Jen handed me the letter with a confused look on her face. Um, I think I must have misread something. That didn't really make any sense. I took the letter and skimmed over it. The handwriting was fairly unintelligible from the get-go, but it only got worse as it went on, and my dyslexic eyes could hardly decipher it. Jen had always been the one to translate doctor's notes and anything written in cursive. Despite my slow deciphering, it seemed correct. The bleeding tree needs our flesh to live. Oh, that's unsettling. Have you ever heard about the bleeding tree? I asked. Now, our town had quite a few legends, urban tales and various myths, but nothing like this. Jen shook her head still looking confused and mildly worried. It's probably a prank, right? She asked. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be. What else? I said, before pointing to the balloon. Yeah, and these helium balloons deflate, like, after a day, right? So somebody had to have put it here really recently. Sure, but... But why? She had a point. In the most secluded forest in our area, a place that seemed untouched by mankind... Why would anyone plant a balloon with a fake note, unless they'd followed me, and even then, who would wander around for hours just to prank someone? How about we just eat? I asked. I'm sure the balloon got caught in the wind or something, then somehow ended up stuck under this tree. Probably wasn't even meant for us, right? She nodded, and we decided to prepare our picnic date. We started with the sandwiches and salad. I decided to keep the wine a secret until the end of the date, or I'd pour her a glass at sunset and propose with a ring, before we fell asleep under the stars. We ate, talked about a future we could only dream about, full of travel, adventures, free from the traditional work and adult responsibilities, we made futile plans about how we could make enough money to disappear off the face of the earth for a few years. We were dreamers, but that's how we liked it. We were always talking about impossible things, some not even remotely grounded in reality. Jen took a knife out of our picnic basket, decided we should write our initials into the tree, to be remembered for the next few decades. Do you want to do it? she asked. I grabbed the knife and cut in, R and J. I lay on the ground and stared up at the tree above. There was a small hole in the otherwise continuous ceiling of leaves, and beyond it hung a brilliant blue sky. An infinite cover for the secrets of the universe. My mind wandered, and I pondered all the possibilities of the world, which triggered a conversation we'd had a thousand times before. Wouldn't it be cool if we could just live forever? I said rhetorically, not expecting an answer. You don't want to live forever, Jen responded as if it were a fact. Well, maybe not forever, but imagine a couple of thousand years to explore. Trust me, you get bored. You can't even finish a movie in one sitting. That's different. I wouldn't get bored of this. Honestly, I could do this until the end of time, I argued. It's not different. An eternity is, by definition, boring. Imagine having solved all the mysteries in the world, having thought every possible thought, Seen every part of every planet. Well, what do you do next? So, you wouldn't want more time. Nope. Life is beautiful exactly because it's fleeting. 
could vanish in a second, meaning we're forced to enjoy it as much as we can. Infinite life would just let us procrastinate finding happiness forever. The discussion went on like that for a while, like it had before, and like it most likely would in the future. As we finished up the salad, I scanned around for the patch of freshly dug dirt, thinking I should start planning the next stage in our date. To my surprise, there were no disturbed parts of the ground. Everything had been grown over, seemingly untouched. I had lost my secret hiding spot, and panic started to rise in my blood. Are you all right? You look a bit worried, Jen asked. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I'm going for a little walk, digest the food and all. Want to come with? No, nah, I think I'll just lie here and write, she responded. Jen pulled out her journal and started writing about her day. She always preferred to relax after a meal, but I had to think. I thought that maybe I could remember where I put the stash if I walked around the area, but, well, I needed to be subtle. It was an oddly quiet afternoon, and though the sun stood high up in the sky, it was almost cold. That, in addition to the lack of animals surrounding the lake, it just felt wrong. I pulled out the letter again and read over the part about the lake being filled with ducks and about animals that surrounded it. Animals that would feed the bleeding tree. Then I saw something that contrasted starkly with the clear water and the smooth rocks beneath it, shattering the monotonous glimmer. Something white. Long sticks littering the lake floor. They were bones. From what I could tell, they mostly seemed like birds' rib cages. Some may be foxes, or other small animals, but a few were larger. Too large to come from any animal that lived in that forest. I took off my shoes to wade into the shallow water. I picked up the largest one. A femur, based on what I could tell, almost looked like it belonged to a human being. Oh my God! I heard Jen yell from the tree. I ran over, not understanding what she was yelling about, until I stepped in something wet and just next to the tree. I looked down at my feet to see a crimson liquid covering seeping up between my toes. What the f... I said, realising all too late that I was standing in a pool of blood. There, she stuttered as she pointed at the tree we'd had our picnic beneath. A pool of dirty blood had gathered around the tree in my absence. The bark where we'd etched our names in had fallen off, and blood emerged from the hole. It was bleeding profusely, bright red liquid flowing out from the tree and mixing with the mud below. What the hell is the tree? I trailed off. It can't be blood. It has to be something else. Jen picked up a long stick and started prodding at the bleeding hole. Jen, don't. It's disgusting, I said, but she'd already shoved the stick deeper into it. The entire tree twitched in reaction, as if filled with muscles, all contracting, trying to avoid the pain of being cut. Jen stepped back in shock, but quickly prodded the tree again to confirm we hadn't just gone crazy. A second prod caused a larger chunk of bark to fall off the tree, revealing pulsating red flesh beneath it. Let's get out of it, I tried to say, but was interrupted by the tree starting to violently shake, pulling up flesh covered roots from the dirt, causing the ground beneath us to shatter into pieces. Within a second, a large cap formed under our feet causing us to crash into a pitch-black hole below. As we tumbled down, we reached out our hands for each other, but with no control, we could only hope to soften the blow. But instead of landing safely, I hit my head on a rock sticking out from the wall. And then I passed out. Once I finally awoke again, it felt like hours had passed. It had turned pitch-black in the time I was out, and the only thing letting know that I hadn't died was the sound of Jen moaning somewhere next to me. I fumbled around for my phone. It had fallen out of my pocket and landed in another pool of blood. I checked myself to see if I was the one bleeding, but apart from what I must have been a mild concussion, I was unscathed. 
My phone still worked, and even without any service, it still functioned as a weak flashlight. It dimly lit up the surrounding cave, and revealed a ceiling of dirt and meat above me. It wasn't night, there simply wasn't a sky to light up anything. Jen lay up against a wall, passed out from the fall. I shone my light at her, and almost dropped my phone in shock. She'd been gutted by a sharp root sticking out from the ground, perforating straight through her abdomen. Jen, please, please wake up! I cried as I gently shook her, careful not to worsen her injury. She slowly opened her eyes and yelped in pain. Oh, what, what happened? She asked. Just lie still, Jen. We fell into the ground. You're hurt. She moved her arms and quickly realised there was a branch sticking out from her belly. Oh my god, get it out, please, get it out, she cried as she tried to pull at the root. It twitched violently in response, putting Jenny into further agony. Jen, you've got to keep still, please. If you move, you'll only make it worse. But it hurts. It hurts so much, she groaned. Yeah, I know, I know, but please don't. I'm going to go find help. We're going to get you out of here, I promise. Just stay still. She grabbed my hand as I tried to stand up. Wait. Don't leave. I don't want to be alone. I'm not leaving you. I just need to look for a way out. I swung the flashlight around the cave, checking for any hole in the ceiling. Any possible way we could have fallen in, but the only way seemed to extend deeper into the ground. A small tunnel digging further into the darkness. The entire ground felt muddy in a mixture between dirt, blood, and the occasional fleshy root sticking up, wriggling around as it looked for us. Each root bled, adding to the pool that slowly filled the cave. Jen, there's no way to climb out of here. I have to check out the tunnel, I said. No, stay. It's not so bad. It's nice. Stay together, she mumbled, drifting in and out of consciousness, delirious from blood loss. I'm sorry, Jen. I have to find help, I said, kissing her on the forehead one last time. I lay down and started to slowly wriggle my way through the dark tunnel. For each inch I moved, I felt another root reach out, trying to grab me. Something white stuck out from the wall ahead, a fractured bone, sharp enough to cut through my flesh as I moved past it. I yelped quietly in pain, feeling warm blood trickling down my arm. As I bled, the root seemed to extend towards me, desperately trying to grab a hold of my newly formed wound, digging themselves inside. The pain was unbearable, but I pulled them out before they got the chance to fest it. The cave opened up into a larger cavern, my weak flashlight doing little to illuminate it. I stood up slowly, almost tripping over while entering, as my foot got caught and something stuck to the ground. It was an arm, half buried in the ground, half digested by its surroundings, only a few pieces of fat and muscle still attached. There were hundreds of mangled bodies scattered around the cavern, alongside various personal effects, phones, glasses, shoes, clothes, backpacks. A flashlight lay next to one of the less digested bodies, beside a wallet and something more familiar. A bottle of wine and a ring box. It was the casket I'd buried in preparation for the date. It had fallen down and shattered on a rock, spilling its contents. I pocketed the ring and picked up the flashlight. The wallet lay open on the ground and I caught a glimpse of the name on the driver's license. It belonged to Jack Gallo. Perhaps it's even the one who wrote the letter we'd found earlier. There was another piece of paper inside the wallet, covered in the same illegible handwriting as before. Dear Sandra, I know this letter won't reach you because I'm already joined with a bleeding tree, slowly becoming one with the eternal forest above us. I wish you were here with me to comfort me through the pain. God, I hope it ends soon. But if not, well... Each route in this place is made from another person. Travellers that got lost in the woods, that have become integrated with the hive mind, and very soon 
I'll be one of them too. I can already hear their thoughts. Only whispers, but they're getting louder. Soon I'll know what they're saying. Even now, as I write. Oh, God, no. This isn't what I wanted. Please, no. Don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. His letter ended abruptly with scribbles that made no sense. I checked around. Among his other possessions, I found a knife and a small shovel. It then dawned on me that he hadn't fallen into a trap like we had, but instead he'd actively dug his way down, looking for a route to join him with the tree. If he could get in, then maybe we could get out. I grabbed his belongings and started crawling back, once more cutting myself on the bone, unable to avoid it. I didn't care about the wounds. I was determined to get Jen out of there, to bring her back to safety, even if it killed me. Jen had awoken by the time I returned, but the root had grown in size, wrapping around, splitting up into smaller tendrils that actively dug into her chest, even bulging out through her skin. I bent down, ready to cut away the fleshy roots, but she grabbed my hand before I could start. She stared into my eyes, pleading for me to stop what I was about to do. Jen, look, come on, look, I know it'll hurt, but I have to cut you loose, I said, tears welling up in my eyes. She just looked back at me, and I could see the pain she was suffering from. I pulled out the little box I'd hidden in my pocket and opened it, revealing the ring. I, I was going to, but... I sobbed, unable to bring out the words I'd practiced for so long before our anniversary. I just hoped she'd understand, and be distracted enough so I could cut the roots. And then, she finally spoke. It's nice here. What? Stay with me. Let's just stay here, she said a voice tired and completely rid of any emotion. Tears ran down my face, but she no longer cared. She wouldn't let me free her. You'll die if you stay here, Jen. Please, I begged. No, nothing dies here. Nothing is allowed to. She smiled, revealing tiny roots extending from her mouth. The tree had completely filled her. Even if I tried to cut her free, she'd still be riddled with the things. No, 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 I'm getting you the fuck out of here, I yelled. I held her arms down and lifted my knife against one of the roots. It was surprisingly sharp considering how old it looked. It easily cut through one of the smaller roots, penetrating Jen's chest. She writhed in agony as the connection severed, blood spurting out from the stump of a root, a hollow tube sticking into her chest. It was her blood. She had become so intertwined with the tree that killing the roots meant taking Jen with it. Jen's smile vanished, and she started crying. Why are you hurting me? Stop it. I don't want to die. I don't want to. She sobbed. Then I did something I'll regret to the end of my days. I had the choice between killing the love of my life or letting her become one with the bleeding tree. Maybe I'm weak. Maybe I'm a coward, but I couldn't take her life. I just couldn't. So, instead, I took the shovel and started digging. I left Jen alone in the dark while I fought for my freedom. For each inch of dirt I removed, more roots and tendrils revealed themselves, reaching out in an attempt at digging themselves into my bleeding flesh. Another bone, another cut. But I kept going, digging with my spade and cutting with a knife, desperate to see the sunlight once more. Can't say for sure what happened next. It's all hazy and a mixture between blood loss and adrenaline surging through my veins. But I remember hitting through the dirt, a ray of moonlight greeting me on the surface, and minutes of crawling away from the bleeding tree to safety. Despite my severe injuries, I made it to my feet, continuously bleeding as I limped my way towards the car. I dropped my phone somewhere while digging, and only had the moon to guide my way back through the dark, silent forest. 
everything seeming grey in the lack of light. And then, at some point along my escape, I just collapsed. That was two months ago. Since then, I've been in the hospital, in and out of a coma. The doctors tell me I suffered septic shock. Apparently, a reoccurring infection kept me at bay until last week, when I finally awoke. They called it a miracle, but it doesn't feel like one. I left the cave to find help, to stop the tree from consuming Jen, but, but by now her flesh has been torn from her bones and I can only imagine she's one with it, to suffer for all eternity. I couldn't save her from an eternity of pain, and it's all my fault. This is my goodbye. No one should suffer the same fate Jen did, and yet I'm going back. I should have killed her before she got consumed by the roots, but now I can do nothing more than to join her. I'm going back. But at least she won't have to suffer alone. So, another four tales for you there for this delightful Friday evening. Hope you all uh, lined up a good weekend ahead of you. Um, I'm going to be taking it easy, watching a bit of rugby. You know, that crazy English sport where you pick the ball up and throw it among well, <laughs> men, women, whoever. And then you wrestle around on the ground in the mud to try and get it back. Yeah, lots of fun, I can assure you. Used to play it as a child. Now I uh, watch from afar. It's enough for me. Well, that's my weekend. Let me know what you're doing in the comment section below the video, and I'll do my best to uh, join in the chat. But until then, well, until next week, that's enough for me. I will uh, be back on Monday with another phenomenal story for you, but wishing you all a good weekend. Until Monday, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>